This is the second in a series of workshops, and my prediction, Bayesian prediction, is there'd be many, many more all over India and a good example for the rest of the world. Now, one point about the Savage Fund that contributed to the support of this workshop, it came out of a similar workshop that operated in the U.S. for over 25 years. And members of that workshop put together about eight or ten books, including Rem Goyle, the report of the 1988 meeting we had here in Bangalore. And all the authors and researchers who contributed to those volumes agreed to have the funds, the royalties, go into the Savage Fund and to be used for specific purposes that would further uh, the progress of Bayesian analysis. So you shouldn't thank me, you should thank all the authors and the discipline who contributed to all those volumes. Volumes on Savage, Jeffries, DeFinetti, uh, even Barnard, who's half Bayesian and half Bayesian. <laughs> so those volumes provided a lot of royalty income for the Savage Fund. And uh, members of the board voted to approve the grant that we made uh, to finance this workshop. Now, getting back to India, I have to congratulate you. My first visit here was in 1974 to attend the Calcutta uh, ISI meeting honoring Malinovis. And then I came back in 74, on my, uh, 78, for well, my 25th wedding anniversary with my wife. We went to the Taj Mahal. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, you really should emphasize tourism more and more. Uh, then in 88, Ben Goyle and Professor Iyengar, who's here, uh, arranged the meeting that we had here in Bangalore, and they uh, co-edited a wonderful volume of papers. And we contributed an analysis of the Indian growth rates. We tried to use our forecasting model to forecast India's rate of growth of real GDP year by year. And the results were terrible for 1978. And somebody in the audience pointed out that's the year the monsoon didn't come. So we, left, we left the factor out of our model, the monsoon. But I hope some of you will pick that approach up because in economics, as uh, was earlier mentioned, there's a lack of empirical work, serious work in testing models with data. Not only hypothesis testing, but the forecasting performance of the models. As I'll mention in the talk, the predictive performance is a criterion used in all the sciences. Very, very important criterion. Einstein cooked up this theory in 1905. Most of the physicists didn't believe his theory until the predictions checked out. Now, when you look at all the macroeconomic models in the U.S., when on a forecasting basis, they missed the turning point. They're terrible. The Federal Reserve Board scrapped its Federal Reserve MIT Penn model just four or five years ago. 171 nonlinear stochastic difference equations. You couldn't even prove that that model had a unique solution, let alone understand its output for policy purposes and so on. And its forecasts weren't very good. It kept missing the turning points. So they finally scrapped it. Remember, Medigliotti, a Nobel Prize winner, they're very talented people, but they didn't know how to build the models. There's a discipline of model building that goes beyond Bayesian analysis that I'll mention in the talk. Now, one person who's been very effective in the role that would interest you, and I hope you can put him in contact with this, uh, Charles Whiteman, chairman of the Department of Economics at the University of Iowa, has been consulting with the governor of the state of Iowa in helping him forecast using Bayesian forecasting techniques state uh, tax revenues and making budgetary policy for the state of Iowa. Now he has the governor making statements like this. The probability that tax revenues next year will be between A and B is 0.75. The governor of the state of Iowa understands that probability statement. Further, Chuck Whiteman has introduced the governor to asymmetric loss functions. When you're forecasting tax, re tax revenues, an error on the positive side is very different from an error of similar magnitude on the negative side. So you don't want to use a symmetric loss function. So we have the governor understand asymmetric loss functions, and they get optimal point predictions relative to asymmetric loss functions, Linux loss functions. So there's an example of where 
Bayesian analysis has been used for quite a few years to guide the governor in making tax policy quite successfully. Now, I have uh, some transparencies here. Introductory problems, so we won't get too theoretical. We'll talk about science. As mentioned, uh, economics is part of the scientific community, and uh, many, many uh, economists never take a course in the philosophy of science. In physics, you're required to take a course in the philosophy of science. I took two years ago. In other fields, you're required to take some work in the philosophy of science. I think economics should get some good philosophers of science in and add that to the curriculum. Now, Bayesian analysis, I'll explain what that is. A new extension of Bayesian analysis is information theory. New developments in information theory are impinging and improving Bayesian analysis. Now, Bayesian analysis has been turned loose on all the problems of economics, business, uh, biology, uh, climatology, uh, agriculture, and so forth. So the way we've approached it from the very beginning is to work problems from several points of view and compare the solutions. So you would take the Bayesian approach with a portfolio problem, you take a non-Bayesian approach, whichever one you want, and you run one against another, like a horse race. And in all these horse races, in estimation, testing, prediction, model selection, control problems, portfolio problems, et cetera, et cetera, the Bayesian approach is generally performed much better than competing approaches. So it's almost like the automobile industry. The non-Bayesians have their techniques. They run them against our Bayesian cars, and the consumer picks the better car. So this is the way, when I got into this in the early 60s, I decided to approach the problem. Axiom systems are very important. Theory, very important. The better mind, how does it work in practice? And along with the good theory. So we'll see Bayesian analysis provides a framework for economic science that, isn't, that wasn't there before Sir Harold Jeffries wrote his book, Theory of Probability, which we'll talk about. Now, Bayesian forecasting is a very good area, and it's related to model formulation. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in that recently. Now, if I don't get to the conclusion now, one is there's a bright future for economic and econometric science. The future looks very good if they do exactly what was said in the inaugural lecture. Get serious about applications. Learn how to do forecasting work and checking the models out seriously, not just learning about diagrams in a textbook. Get the data and check out the models. Okay, and then it pays to go base. We'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, Bayes' theorem, to remind you, this is a, a modern version of it. It was published in 1763, two years after the death of Bayes. And then also Laplace in France, the great mathematician and physicist, is supposedly said to have derived Bayes' theorem independently. It's still unknown. But generally, you have a joint density function for the parameter vector and the observation vector, both considered random, subjectively random. And given the background information, there may be little background information or a lot of background information. Whatever background information you have, you break up this joint density using the product rule of probability. Marginal conditional, marginal conditional. That's elementary probability theory. Then you solve for g of theta given y. g of theta given y, if I've done this algebra correctly, is equal to pi of theta, f of y given theta over h of y. The h of y is a normalizing constant, so you can write it proportional to the prior. This is called, when viewed as a function of theta, the likelihood function. So whatever problem you have, estimation, you set up a prior density for theta that re reflects your current information about possible values of theta. Maybe theta is a binomial parameter. It goes 0 to 1. You're uncertain about its value, so you take a uniform density for pi of theta. Then this is the likelihood function that reflects the information in the sample. So Bayes' theorem combines the prior information and the sample information to, into a posterior distribution. G of theta given y incorporates the information from here and here 
And once you have g of theta given y, you can compute probability intervals for theta. It's theta between a and b. You can compute those probability intervals. And um, also, you can, uh, if you have sub-vectors, theta 1, theta 2, you're interested in theta 1, but theta 2 is a nuisance for vector, vector, vector parameters. You can just integrate out theta 2. This is the Bayesian way of getting rid of nuisance parameters. For example, if you're doing a set of regression equations, you're interested in the regression coefficients. You're not so much interested in the covariance matrix and the error terms. So here are the regression coefficients, here are the elements of the covariance matrix. You do this integral and you get the marginal density. Exact finite sample result. For time series models, simultaneous equation models, logic models, probit models, you name it, all those models have been worked, the references are in the paper, and you get exact results out. Okay, so for those of you who haven't seen Bayes' theorem, uh, this is a version that's uh, very useful in understanding the approach to estimation. If you have a loss function, you could ask what point estimate minimizes expected loss, where you average the loss function using g of a to give it y. So if you have quadratic loss, whatever the problem, the mean is optimal. If you have absolute error loss, whatever the problem, the median is optimal. If you have zero one loss, the modal value is optimal. So you tailor the point estimate to the loss function that you're using. The governor of the state of Iowa is using an asymmetric Linux loss function introduced by Varian, a student many years ago at Berkeley. He used it for real estate assessment. Their asymmetric loss, you overassess a property, people take you to court. It's really serious. And if you're an elected tax assessor and you overassess, you may not get reelected. If you underassess, you lose a little revenue. So it's a very asymmetric situation. But he was the one who co concocted this asymmetric loss function, and you can cook up very dry estimates that are optimal relative to it. Okay, now here's a very classic problem. It goes back to Laplace, the early 19th century. And it relates to our family very directly. We have five sons. So think of trials. First trial, second trial, third trial. The outcome, son, daughter. Theta is the probability of a son on a given trial. And if you're willing to assume the trials are independent and theta remains constant, this, as you know, is binomial trials with the complication that all the trials turn out to be sons, five of them. First try, son, second son, third son, fourth. <laughs> okay. Now the likelihood function, if these are independent, is stated to the fifth power. Okay, that's the probability of getting five sons in a row, given the binomial model, given the parameter theta is constant. Okay, here's the general expression for uh, a probability mass function in n tries r, uh, you have to r results of one kind. If n is equal to r, then you get, if n is 5 and r is 5, this reduces to theta to the fifth. This is 5, 5, that's 1, theta to the fifth, 1 minus theta to the 5 minus 5, that's 0, so this is the likelihood function. Okay, now let's take the most Standard non-Bayesian procedure for estimating theta. R.A. Fisher propounded that in India and all around the world. In 1974, the ghost of Fisher was hovering over India. Even though he wasn't here, most people followed Fisher and his maximum likelihood approach. All right, what's the maximum of theta to the fifth? Theta equals one. That's the maximum likelihood estimate. And I challenge anybody in the room to compute a standard error. <laughs> okay. Or how do you test the hypothesis theta is 1? Under theta equal 1, the process is deterministic. You can't get a test statistic and get its distribution under the null, which is the standard name in Pearson approach. So if theta is 1, this process is deterministic. And you have a hell of a time testing the hypothesis theta is 1. Now notice, too, if you try once and you get a sum, the maximum likelihood estimate is one. Two tries, two sums, the maximum likelihood estimate is one, and so forth. So if you have two tries, it's theta squared, maximum one, and so on. 
Okay, now the Bayes-Laplace approach is, as I said, to put in a prior times the likelihood function and the posterior distribution for partial. Well, we see the likelihood function is theta to the fifth. C is a normalizing constant. Here I've taken pi of theta the prior uniform, zero to one. I'm not sure what the value of theta <coughs> is. I'll be diffuse or non-informative. I use a flat prior. I could use other priors, but if I'm ignorant, a flat prior is one uh, choice. So then the normalizing constant is six. Okay, now there's the plot of the posterior distribution. And having that plot, as Laplace computed, the mean of theta is six sevenths. The modal value is one. See, the mode is up here at one. But the mean is six sevenths. And you just compute the mean of this theta times theta to the fifth with the six out here, you get six sevenths. So this is an example of the Laplace rule of succession. One n plus one over n plus two gives you the mean that's optimal relative to quadratic loss. So here is a very difficult problem that comes up a lot. If you're testing a theory, one time you get a success, two times success, three times. What is your degree of confidence in the theory? What's your inference about theta? You get the complete distribution and you can make probability statements about a theta very directly. The general application of Bayes theorem leads you to take the posterior on of the two hypotheses, theta equal one versus theta equal half, <coughs> equal to the prior odds times the Bayes factor. The probability of getting five sums and five trials. It's fine. Okay. Uh, given five trials and theta equal one. That's one, right? And the probability of five sums and five trials given the theta is a half. That's one half to the fifth. So the odds are 32 to one on one versus a half. Now you've got the probabilities on the two high bottoms. The odds, 32 to one. We started one to one. Pi one over pi two to one. So you go from one to one to 32 to one. You can also check uh, the hypothesis theta equals one versus theta uniformly distributed. And that comes out six to one, favoring theta equal one versus theta uniformly distributed. So that's a good example of analyzing a difficult hypothesis testing problem. And what could be wrong with this that you mentioned in your talk? You see anything wrong with this analysis? How do you know the trials are IID by movie with the constant theta? As far as I know, people don't know what the process is. So you get some model and it's certain people. You want to experiment with the model. So that's a very important point. And you, you, you have to get a good model. All right, now it was mentioned that Bayesian methods have been used in portfolio analysis. Useful trends on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs, at CDC Investment Management Company. Bankers trust, they're using techniques like this, and the whole thing came out of the joint paper that Chetty and I did, published in 1965. I hate to admit I go back that far. <laughs> but of course, you go back that far, right? <laughs> okay. So for each stock, the I stock, here's the future guy, next year's value. Here are the input variables, determining next year's value. Here is the coefficient beta sub i from the vector, and ui f is the error term next year. Now the return on the portfolio is the number of dollars you put into the first stock times the return on the first stock, plus the number of dollars you put in the second times the return and so on. This gives you the return in the next future period. And you can write that as W prime Y F. Vector inner product. Okay. Now you get the density function of this RF. It's a linear combination of the y axis. So if you assume a normal likelihood function and the diffuse prior, you can write down the density function of this RF given beta and sigma. Everything's normal, this will be normal. <coughs> and the trouble is beta and sigma is there. But from these past data, you can get a posterior distribution for beta and sigma. And then you do this integral to get rid of those nuisance parameters and you get the marginal density of RF, the experience portfolio return, given the past data and information. Now the utility is F of RF times the utility of the return. 
DRF. That's expected utility. And the problem is the max expected utility with respect to the vector W and the elements of W add up to initial well. And as this is a quadratic utility function, this is really duck soup to solve. And you come up with the optimal amounts to put in the stock. Now this is the simplified, most simplified version of this problem. In actual application, they made these betas time variants. They've used shrinkage techniques, etc. In the references I should have put in the paper, you can uh, check those there out. But this is the basic idea. And uh, in analyzing past data, their cumulative return with shrinkage or with using the CD, the underlying regression setup, Bayesian, and where's the cumulative return on the S&P 500 from 1986 through 1993. So they have cumulative return compares very favorably to this one. Okay, now here's the Linux loss function. Here's the estimation error, or the prediction error. Here's zero loss if you got right D equals theta. If you're on the right, it goes up like this. If you're on the left, it goes up like that. Asymmetric loss. Now if you have a posterior distribution for theta, you just take expected loss. Differentiate defines minimal expected loss with respect to D. Here's the general solution. So whatever your process, this is the quantity you want to compute to be optimal relative to this asymmetric loss. If theta happens to have a mean of y bar, the variance sigma square over m, that is normally distributed, posterior distribution, then this this uh, works out to be the optimal estimate is pi bar, that's the sample mean, minus a times sigma squared over 2a. So you, if a is positive, you don't want to overestimate. This holds the estimate back. So it's a correction to y bar. And this estimator, if you do it over and over again, uniformly dominates y bar relative to uh, the asymmetric loss function. Well, that's in the literature, oh God, it all the way back to the 70s. So it's very, very important. Now let's look at a simple control problem. This is a policymaker's control problem. Uh, it caused people really very serious problems until the Bayesian approach came along. You have a simple regression. Here's the policy control error. Chicago is always the money supply. <laughs> Here's income. Okay. Now you want income to be close to a target, A. And you're willing to express loss as being off target by Y minus A. So the question is, how do you set X to minimize expected loss? To substitute from here, expand, take the expectation using the predictive, uh, the posterior distribution for beta and sigma square. There is expected loss. That's a quadratic in X. Any undergraduate can minimize that. But here's the minimizing value for X. So X is the target value. B, if you use a diffuse prior, is the least squared estimate of data. And then you have this correction, which reflects the degree of dispersion of the posterior distribution for data. So this correction factor will go to zero as N gets large. Data, to zero. This goes to one, and A over B will be good in large samples, but not in small samples. Now, in the literature before this came on the scene, people were doing this. They have the target to get the least square root estimate. They form the ratio, and that's the certainty equivalent solution. It's been shown analytically, not waving hands or anything, that this is somehow relative to this solution, given the particular loss. Now this is the simplest problem of this type. This has been generalized to the vector control variables, costs of changing the control variables, all the problems that Tinberg took up in his work on social policy making have been reanalyzed from this point of view, and very interesting solutions have occurred. And applications too. Okay, now turning points. We've been doing a lot of work on turning points over the last five or ten years. We have the country, the ice countries, the rate of growth of real GDP in the 
we have t minus 2, t minus 1. Here's the rate of growth in the current period. And this is next year's rate of growth. We don't know next year's. But if the points line up like that, we're going to have a chart. This one is below this one, and these are two are below this one. If this one is not below this one, there's no damage. Okay, so we want to get a probability statement on the probability of a downturn. And then we want to choose an optimal forecast. Downturn, no downturn. The same thing goes through with upturn and upturn. So we write the density function of yi t plus 1. Given the parameter, whatever the model is, usually you can write this down. From the past data, we have a posterior distribution for theta. And we do this integral to get the predicted density. In fact, we're going to these nuisance parameters. So there's the predicted density. And we can get the probability that yit plus 1 is less than yit by doing this integral. So that gives you then a way of making the probability statement that the uh, next period outcome will be below this period. Now, graphically, here's the picture. This is the predicted density function for next year rate group of real GDP. This is the current rate of growth. This is the probability of a downturn. Now we have a two by two law structure. This is very important to use in decision theory. We have two forecasts, downturn, no downturn. Here are the outcomes, downturn, no downturn. If we're right, we scale the losses to zero. But if we forecast downturn and no downturn occurs, we experience a loss C1, positive. No downturn and downturn occurs C2. Now we have these probabilities on the states. If we take this act, this times zero plus this times this is the expected loss. If we take this act, this times this plus this times zero is the expected loss. Given that we know the C1 and the C2 and the D, we can see which one is smaller and choose the forecast with the smaller expected loss. Now we make this a symmetric loss structure, C1 equals C2. All this boils down to, if this probability of downturn is greater than a half, say downturn. If it's less than a half, then downturn. Now we've applied this setup to data for 18 countries, 18 industrialized countries, 1954 to 1995. And we had in the period of forecast, uh, 211 turning points to forecast. And this procedure gave us 70% correct. So pretty encouraging. And this is just one model. We considered about six or eight models. We varied the model to see if we continued to get good performance. And indeed, we did. OK, so there uh, we have a nice forecasting uh, tool. And to show you the models, some of the models we considered. Here is the highest country growth rate in the T period rate of growth of real GDP annually. Here is an AR3 plus an error term. This is a special box making problem. This one performed terribly. Missed all the turning points. It overshoots at the top. The economy is going down uh, and the model keeps going up. At the bottom, the economy turns up. This model keeps going down. You can see what the problem was just by running this model. But you couldn't do it theoretically. You have to do it in here. So we put in some leading indicator variables. The lag rate of growth of real money, the lag rate of growth of real stock prices, and this is the median stock return across the 18 countries. So we fit this, you can almost fit it by these squares and make four pants, you get much, much better results. There was a model like this that you have 70% of the majority points like that, correctly, out of uh, 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 195. Uh, I'm sorry, from 1974 to 1995, 211 30 points. So here you can see the percentage correct for different models. For different models, no pooling and pooling, shrinking. And you can see you're over 70% for different models we're using. As long as we get those leading indicators that have been there, we got pretty good results. Now we're all, of course, trying to improve on these results by formulating newer and better models. I won't go into that, but uh, you can uh, 
It's going to be with us for a lifetime. And then here, for example, you've got Australia for Bill Griffin's benefit in 1977. The probability of a downturn in Australia was 0.68. <coughs> and in Australia, the economy turned down. So if, in 1980, the probability of a downturn was 0.83, and it turned down. So Australia was a very nice case. Japan was a little more troublesome. But you can do this country by country, get the probabilities, and interpret the probability very directly. And this procedure beats a coin flipper or uh, a person who's always pessimistic, you know, no upturn, downturn all the time in forecast, or you get an optimist, always said no downturn and upturn in forecast. These procedures beat those uh, benchmark models. Okay, let's turn to a completely different problem. I know some of you are deeply concerned about golf. And Bayesian analysis to use in golf. I'll give you one example. There's a paper quoting on that. Okay, this came up last year. Uh, there's a conference honoring a friend, George Judge, who's an avid golfer. He needs help. So <laughs> if you have a par three hole, and let's say it's 200 yards long, the green is surrounded by water, and you've got the probability, so I'll use a three iron to try to get the green. Of course, I'll use a seven iron, lay up, be safe, and then chip on. Okay, how do you make the decision? Well, here are the possible outcomes. A hole in one, a birdie, a par, a, a, a bogey, a double bogey, triple bogey. We won't go beyond that. <laughs> That's too much. It shouldn't be on the board. Okay, now what you have to do with the three iron is to assess the probability of a hole in one. You can put 202 or something. Uh, a birdie, a par, a score, you may go into the water, so there's a certain probability of a five and a six. Now, if you use the seven iron, you use the whole possible probability of a hole in one, it's be zero. So Q1 would be directly zero. Q2, very low. Q3 might be a little higher. Q4, somewhat higher. Q5 and six, if you take the seven iron and your second shot, you chip into the water, you can easily get a five or a six. Okay, now we got the probability. What's the expected score if I didn't use the three iron? I take P1 times 1 plus P2 times 2, and I compute the expected score if I use the three iron. Here, if I use the seven iron, I can compute the expected score. So my utility function is linear and smaller. I choose the club with the lower expected score. On the other hand, if I have a utility of a 1, utility of a 2 and so forth, then I can compute expected utility by hitting the probabilities times the utility and choose the cloud that gives the higher expected utility. Well, this is just one particular problem of a large number that you can analyze using the concept of probability I'm using, not a long-run frequency definition. Most people don't know what concept of probability they're using. You use the axiomatic, the lower run frequency, the infinite population, uh, the degree of reasonable belief, and the betting definition of probability. Most students don't know which one they're using. If you don't know the definition, you're all mixed up. So it's very important to check Jeffrey's book, Theory of Probability, Chapter 7, where he, the physical scientist, Sir Harold Jeffrey, at Cambridge University, in Britannia, rules the waves. Uh, he, he considers all the definitions I mentioned. And here's a physical scientist coming down on the definition. Probability is a numerical measure of degree of belief in a proposition. So P1 is my numerical measure of my degree of belief that I'll use a 3R and I'll get a hold of mine. You can use that, that definition. You can associate probabilities with hypotheses, which you can't do if you use uh, the long-run frequency definition. So the make very important is settled on the particular definition of utility that you're using. Now many of you arrange meetings. Sharika will use this for you. You invite in individuals to your meeting. Uh, some people say they're coming and they don't come. You can't be sure that a person will come to your meeting. So individual one, this is the probability that he's coming or she's coming. Here's individual two, this is the probability. This person will be there and so forth. You add up those probabilities, 
you have n invitations outstanding, this gives you the expected number of coming. Okay, now suppose you have expense associated with the first person, travel expense, example, A1, A2 for two. So this you can hit the expenses by the probability that add those up, and that gives you the expected alpha L of the mean. Now I've used this for our Bayesian seminar meetings for 25 years. <laughs> it works like a charm. But I won't take you through the optimization problems you can do with this. But uh, you can then have a target number and decide how many <coughs> offers to make and solve for the optimal number of offers to make. And we're taking it down on a budgetary restriction and so forth. But this is a canonical problem. Very important. If you're making offers to students coming to your graduate program, what's the probability the first person will accept the offer given that this is the fellowship award? The second, the third. And then you get the expected outlay on fellowships. And here's the expected number of showing up in the program. And I checked with a dean in Chicago and asked how he made his decision. He said, well, if I want 245 students, I make 500 offers. He was using the probability of a half on average. You know, if he makes 500 offers, about half of them will accept it. This is a more detailed consideration of the problem. And if all of these are the same, you can get the dean's solution. But this gives you a way of putting in more information. Now, as regards science in general, okay, now, there's some question, can economics be a science? According to the unity of science principle, put forward by Carl Pearson and Sir Harold Jeffries, unified methods for learning from data and making decisions are what constitute being scientific. So according to their principle, any area of activity, even the analysis of golf, can be a science if you use the methods, the unified methods for learning from data and making decisions. So if you use the appropriate methods and good data, I should add, you can be a scientist in any area. Years ago, people didn't think economics could be a science. You go back to the Middle Ages, they didn't think physics could be a science. So every area of activity now, sports statistics is a science. You have areas becoming sciences, financial economics, stock market analysis, scientific work. People on Wall Street using high tech, very interesting and useful techniques. Okay, so the use of the, the scientific statistical methods necessary for a field to be, uh, be, be, be considered a science. And one of the main objectives of science is to learn from data and experience. You, know, you have several types of, induct, uh, of inference, deductive inference, inductive inference, and reductive inference. Deduction is mathematics. You prove theorems, as you mentioned in your talk. That's not science. You just get three types of conclusions. I can prove the theory, I, a theorem, I can't prove the theory, or I'm ignorant. You want something in between, as Jeffries mentions and others, and that's induction. Generalization from past data and experience to explain and predict new data. That's how he defines induction. And that's the heart of science. Okay. Now notice, predict new data, predict. It's a fact that in economics and many other fields, researchers hate to predict. If you make some predictions, it's easy to see whether you're good or bad. So they love to do theorems, they love to have models, but they hate to put them on the line and make actual forecasts. So we're pressuring people to do that. And we've made forecasts, as I mentioned, of turning points, point forecast for GDP, growth rates for 18 countries, even for India. In the, the volume you published, we had analysis of the Indian data, as I mentioned. So we're pushing that very hard. In the macro area, you have Keynesian models, neo-Keynesian models, monetarist models, neo-monetarist models, real business cycle models, generalized real business cycle models. In 1991, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis wanted to know what the data show in supporting these different very, uh, I should say, very impressive theoretical models. And you know what happened? There wasn't much testing of these models. People weren't testing them and forecasting. So the conference ended sort of flat. <laughs> they had descriptions of the theories, but no forecasting results. So the people should get more serious about checking out these macro models, macroeconometric models in particular. They're noted for not forecasting well. They blow up 
And when you talk about vector autoregressions, you probably encounter those. They're very awful regressions. They don't forecast well. So check the forecasting performance. It's very important. Now, they include in the induction measurement and description. If you have bad data, it's hard to measure something precisely or describe something precisely. So you know, in the physical scientists, people spend a lot of time to get good measurements. And more and more in economics and business, people are getting serious about the data and generating better and better data over the years. But they're still not perfect. In the US, they revised the productivity figures just recently. Clinton, so happy they revised them upward. <laughs> and the output growth rates were revised upward for the late 90s. So everything worked out well for Clinton coming up in the, uh, the election in the year 2000. But I can tell you many horror stories about our data, and I'm sure you have similar horror stories about yours. <laughs> Let's not be, get depressed. Now the question is, where do these models come from? Generalizations. That's called reduction. This physicist, Charles Pierce called this the area of reduction, studying data and facts and devising theories to explain empirical phenomena. Frankly, that's wide open. People don't know how to do that. Even the Bayesian approach, while well, it's somewhat helpful in comparing models, it doesn't tell you where a new model comes from. So I, in reading up on this in various places, you have references in the paper, people emphasize unusual facts produce unusual facts, and then try to explain the unusual facts. And many times that generates new models, new hypotheses, and so on. There are many examples of that in the literature. Then another controversy is whether you should start simply and complicate if you have to. So I call that, in American industry, they call it, keep it simple, stupid, KISS. But since some simple models are stupid, I changed it to keep it sophisticatedly simple. <laughs> okay. Now, there are two camps here. Chicago and many other physical scientists, many statisticians like to start simply and complicate if you have to. George Box, many others. In economics, there's a group. Uh, shall I mention names? Larry Klein. I quote, the world is complicated, therefore we need complicated models. <laughs> you think about that statement. His complicated models are all very ingenious, don't work very well in forecasting. <laughs> okay. uh, so this is, then you have, um, who is that fellow? Hendry in England, general to specific. Most of you have probably heard about that. How many models has he produced at work? Zero. Zero, over 20 years. Okay, when you pick a general model, there's a huge number of general models you can start with. If you get the wrong one, everything else is terrible. So starting simply, you can see what's wrong with the model, as I mentioned in our forecasting, we were missing the turning points. Well, leading indicators, Burns and Mitchell using pre-World War II data, found looking at the data for Germany, the UK, uh, the US and France, that stock prices and money lead in the business cycle. News of that hits the economy, the stock market reacts immediately. The economy reacts with a lag. You increase the money supply, you get an extra thousand dollars, let's say, unexpectedly. It takes you a little while to figure out what you're going to do with it. You know, which computer are you going to buy? Or shall I have an operation or something like that? So there's usually a lag between the increase in the money supply and the impact on the real economy. Burns and Mitchell found that empirically, and we built that into our forecasting model. And without that, without that, the models don't work. With it, they work much, much better. Okay, so this is very important to figure out how to produce unusual facts. If you're an empirical worker, always try to produce unusual facts. Take the current theories, push them to extremes. What happens to Friedman's theory of the consumption function when you get very poor consumers? Do they consume nine-tenths of their income? Yeah. People have gotten the data and shown a departure. Over the mid-range, 0.9 is not too bad. But at the low end, at the very high end, there are departures. Now you need a new theory to, general, to cover the broader range of the data. OK, now I'll give you references to some of this material. And uh, it's really a very, very difficult problem to formulate good models. George Box and others emphasize a two-way interaction. You don't start with the theory and go to the data all the time. In our macro area, we didn't have very good theory at all. So we started with the data and found something that works. And now we're getting the economic theory to rationalize our empirical model. 
Many engineers and physicists work that way. We get something that works in practice. We don't know why. Cook up a theory to explain why it works. Then check it further to make sure you got the right theory. So that's the way we've been working, and we call this the structural econometric modeling time series analysis approach. We get an empirical time series model that works pretty well, then we get the economic theory to rationalize it. And we've done that with that forecasting equation I mentioned to you. Now the Bayesian approach comes in to help, as I mentioned, on estimation, testing, prediction, model selection, model combining, uh, just you name any topic in statistics. And the Bayesian approach has been compared with the non-Bayesian approach to see how well the two various approaches work. And the Bayesian approach has been very, very lucky in coming out well in these horse races. Estimation of the reciprocal, estimation of a ratio, a central problem in simultaneous equation estimation. Bayesian estimators have better properties than non-Bayesian estimators. If you have a mean and you want to estimate one over the mean, you have yi equals theta plus ui. Most people will say, I'll estimate one over the mean by one over y bar. Do you know what the properties of one over y bar are? No moments exist. In small samples, the density can be bimodal. In large samples, it's great. But in small samples, you have problems. So in all these areas, as I say, these comparisons have been made, control problems, decision problems, and without exception, the Bayesian approach has really looked very good. Is there a for Bayes, non-Bayes? Is there a formal axiom, a for formal learning model? Bayes' theorem is the learning model. Non-Bayesians don't have a learning model. They learn informally. Axiomatic support. There are all kinds of axiom systems for Bayesian analysis. I don't know of any axiom systems for the non-Bayesian approach. Thank you. Probabilities associated with hypotheses. Yes in the Bayesian approach, no in the non-Bayesian approach. So you can't say the probability of rain tomorrow is 0.5 in a non-Bayesian frequentist definition of probability. The probability defined as a measure of degree of confidence in the proposition, yes, with Jeffries and others, no elsewhere, and so forth. So these are uh, issues that come up and let me take one in particular. Uses subjective prior information. I put yes and yes. When you choose a functional form for a model, you're using a tremendous amount of prior information. Shall it be a Cobb-Douglas production function, a CES, generalized production function? What's the form of the relationship? You use all kinds of prior information. Should the irritators be normal or double? Uh, it could be double exponential or student t. How do you decide that? A lot of judgment goes in there. So I, and others I quote in the paper, mention that both Bayesians and non-Bayesians use a lot of prior information. And then as I mentioned, both approaches give good asymptotic results. In finite samples, the Bayes approach gives finite sample results, sometimes elsewhere. Okay, now to use Bayes' theorem, you need a likelihood function, you need a prior, and you need Bayes' theorem. You get nothing for nothing in this slide. What if you don't know the form of the likelihood function? What can you do? Okay, one thing is you can use the empirical likelihood approach, or a bootstrapped likelihood approach, or the Bayesian method of moments, which I cooked up in 1994. Let me give you one example of this. These are time to failure data. Those are your testing products. How long do they last? But there might be spells of unemployment for different workers. And you have N observations. Theta is a location parameter. Ui is the irritant, realized irritant. These are numbers. Yi might be 4.3. Yi plus 1 is 6.2. So Yi isn't random. This theta is unknown. And we'll consider it subjectively random. The Ui is a realized irritant like an unknown parameter. So we'll consider it subjectively random. Now we do this very math uh, difficult mathematical operation. We sum both sides and divide by m. <laughs> so we get y bar equals theta plus u bar. Now we take the mean through the observations, subjective mean. y bar is a number, like 4.2. So the mean of y bar is y bar. The mean of theta, given the data and the assumptions I'm going to tell you about, 
response to me and you, Bart, given the data and the assumptions. Okay, now, if we think this model is appropriate, there's why I should be here, not log yi. We haven't left out any variables. There's no outliers. If we think everything's okay with the model and the data, we may be willing to assume a priori that the mean of u bar is zero. That's assumption. Now we make that assumption, we've got the mean of theta equals y bar. So we get a post data mean for theta is equal to the sample mean without a prior, without a likelihood function, without Bayes' theorem. Now, if you study physics and chemistry, you know the most spread out density with this mean that's proper, if you maximize entropy to get the density, is the exponential density. So if you ask what is the most conservative density, most spread out, least informative, that has this mean and is proper, there it is. And once you have this, you can make probability statements about possible values of theta. The probability of theta is between A and B can be computed quite readily. So you, this is the problem Bayes uh, solved. And you can solve it uh, using this Bayesian method of movements approach. Now, I don't have too much time to tell you about the other applications of this. We've, we've applied it to regression models, multivariate regression models, uh, probit, logit, semi-parametric models, simultaneous equation models. So this with more moments. Instead of just one moment on the use, two moments, three moments, or four moments. And you can get out a wide range of density functions for the parameters and also predictive density functions for the future observations. So this is something new in information theory. This is the last transparency on information theory. Information theory has been used by Jeffries, by Bernardo and Berger, by Lindley, by a number of others to produce prior distributions. You set out a criterion functional, you optimize it, and you get a prior. It's optimal in an information theoretic sense. I'll talk on that tomorrow. Okay. You can also get, as in physics, through Mac information theory models for the observations. You have sampling moment side conditions. You can get sampling models for the observation. A likelihood function can be provided by information theory. So you can use information theory to get the prior, the model, and that uh, is very good. You have two pieces. So how do you, I showed you Bayes' theorem and how you derive it. That derivation depends upon the product rule of probability. If you want another derivation, you can use information theory to combine these two to get Bayes' theorem. So that was in the American Statistician 1988 with discussion by uh, Bruce Hill and uh, Ed James and a number of others. So you can derive Bayes' theorem using information theory, an alternative derivation of Bayes' theorem. And when you do that, the information in, in the prior and the model, equals the information out in the posterior distribution. So you, you don't lose any information. So in an engineering sense, you're 100% efficient. So Bayes' theorem as an information processing procedure is 100% efficient. Now you can vary the side conditions and get new learning models. And people are doing that to generalize Bayes' theorem. Think of the theory of the firm. You have the static profit maximization, one period. You have dynamic profit maximization over a period. You get different rules for the firm. You think about information processing, if you change the conditions, you get different information processing rules. So that's where the future will be. You might say, put a, a wider range of models on the shelf to use uh, when you're using, analyzing particular problems. Okay, then you can use information theory to measure the information provided by an experiment. When you're designing experiments, you can decide on optimal designs using a criterion functional, this has already been done, uh, using a criterion functional from information theory. Then I mentioned the Bayesian method of moments approach that uses information theory. And then uh, Jeffrey's pullback Leibler distance measures are being used in various contexts to measure the distance of one model from another and uh, as a basis for producing discrimination statistics. So here are some references that are in the paper. Barry et al. have a book 
1996, in which they're review articles by Sufi. And he has another one in Falmby and Hill. And then I, in my collected papers, 97, you can see some of these papers I mentioned too. And the best reference on the information theory that I found is this book by Clover and Thomas, Information Theory, Wiley, 1991. Very clearly written, many good applications, <laughs> not too much philosophy. So it's a very useful book, I think. Okay, well then I'll summarize by saying, to this point, if you view the Bayesian approach vis-a-vis -vis others, and view it as a horse race to decide which approach works the best. My honest opinion is the Bayesian approach works better than almost any other approach you can imagine. Maximum likelihood, uh, generalized least squares, uh, whatever approach you can think of now, the Bayesian approach has come off very well in comparison with others. In estimation, testing, prediction, policy analysis, stock portfolio formation, et cetera, et cetera control problems, et cetera. So this makes me say, as I said in an article in the late 80s, that we're in the beginning of a Bayesian era. This is going to be the century of Bayes, as many people have said, and it would be a good idea to get in on the ground floor. Thank you very much. Thank you.